So uh, welcome. Uh, thanks very much for attending this book talk. Um, you know, my uh, my training uh, professionally is as a, a teacher of literature. Um, so it was kind of tempting to to do a uh, an analysis kind of on, on, on that end of things. And I, I don't think that's what's really important with this one. Um, so I'm going to be doing something a little different than I, I might have done, you know, in a in an academic classroom. Um, but, you know, I think this book, for me, it was a it was an incredible experience reading it. Um, and, you know, part of that might be um, like, yeah, I'm not from Appalachia. Uh, I'm not from southwestern Virginia, uh, but, you know, I am from the the deep country. I, I did spend the first years of my life in a in a trailer at the end of a dirt road on, on top of a hill. Um, and a lot of what the author talks about in this in this book really, you know, resonated. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining me. And um, kind of the big question I think that I want to raise about the book uh, as we go into it is what makes this a working class uh, novel? Because that's what I'm going to argue um, that it is uh, a very important uh, working class novel, in fact. Um, so uh, just um, to kind of reiterate, uh, the book we're talking about is Demon Copperhead um, by Barbara Kingsolver. Um, she won, I believe, the Pulitzer Prize for it. Um, uh, it's her. She's she has she has a long career as a novelist. Um, uh, some of her other works include uh, the Poisonwood Bible, um, which is uh, set in uh, Congo at the time of the um, the anti-colonial revolution there, uh, and uh, a number of other books. So she, she's a, she's a very you know, prominent novelist, and she's also uh, she was raised in Appalachia. Um, and when she uh, decided to write this book, decided to write a book about Appalachia, she um, she said she turned to Dickens uh, to tell a story about um, structural poverty. Uh, and uh, for anybody who's read uh, uh, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, um, a lot of the the big arc of this story and some of the, even the names of the characters uh, will be uh, will be recognizable. It's been a long time since I read David Copperfield, so uh, don't don't grill me on that end of things. Um, I think what I'm going to do just to start off is start at the beginning of the book and read uh, the opening passage. Um, first couple of pages. I've, I've taken a chunk out of the middle. The passages I read are not going to be, they're, you know, edited in some ways, just, you know, shortened. Um, so I've, to get to the, the meat of it. And then we'll, I'll kind of open up from there on um, how I think we, we ought to approach this book. So here goes. This is the beginning of Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. First, I got myself born. A decent crowd was on hand to watch. They've always given me that much. The worst of the job was up to me, my mother being, let's just say, out of it. On any other day, they'd have seen her outside on the deck of her trailer home, good neighbors taking notice, pestering the tit of trouble as they will. All through the dog breath air of late summer and fall, cast an eye up the mountain and there she'd be, little bleach blonde smoking her pall malls, hanging on that railing like she's captain of her ship up there and now might be the hour it's going down. This is an 18-year-old girl we're discussing, all on her own, and as pregnant as it gets. The day she failed to show, it fell to Nance Peggett to go bang on the door, barge inside, and find her passed out on the bathroom floor, with her junk all over the place and me already coming out. A slick, fish-colored hostage, picking up grit from the vinyl tile, worming and shoving around because I'm still inside the sack that babies float in, free real life. This kid, if he wanted a shot at the finer things, should have got himself delivered to some rich or smart or Christian, non-using type of mother. Anybody will tell you the born of this world are marked from the get out, win or lose. Me though, I was a born sucker for the superhero rescue. Did that line of work even exist in our trailer home universe? Had they all quit Smallville and gone looking for bigger action? Save or be saved, these are the questions. 
you want to think it's not over till the last page. So that was the opening uh, of the novel. Um, and for those who just joined us, once again, that was uh, uh, this is Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. Um, and the author tells us a lot about the novel in those first, those first couple of paragraphs. Um, and there is there is a lot going on, right? It's um, sort of seems like the author is piling up everything that could possibly, you know, go wrong at somebody's birth, uh, right? Mother with uh, substance use disorder, um, passed out on the bathroom floor, uh, home birth, um, this and that. Um, and what it kind of raises is the question of realism, right? So is this a is this a realist novel? Is this a, a real depiction of what society is like? And that's a really complicated question, right? Um, what we might say is it's a kind of hyper-realist novel. Um, so the stuff that King Solver describes, and there's a lot of, as as others have said, grimy stuff that's gonna that's gonna happen in this novel. Um, all of which is. Uh, you know, very real. Um, the the you know vicissitudes of the the foster care system, struggles with addiction, uh, poverty, uh, domestic violence. Um, but what happens in the novel is that um, because this isn't really just a novel about a person, it's a novel about society. It's a critique of society. So society gets distilled down into the experiences of a single person, gets concentrated um, in a certain sense. And that's why you see this kind of, um, we'll see it throughout the novel, this kind of piling up of, of the most, the worst and most degrading uh, aspects of our, of our society um, with, a correspond, with a corresponding struggle by the the main character the the baby who's being born here uh also the title character uh demon real name damon but goes by demon um his struggle to kind of find a way of processing all that and maintain his humanity in that and uh, the way he's going to do that has a lot to do with what makes this a working class uh novel and most of what I'm going to focus on is uh, from a, a chunk right in the middle of the novel at a, a key turning point. Um, and I'm going to try not to give too many spoilers, but it's hard to give a book talk without uh, without some. Um, Damon is going to, when he's 10 years old, um, uh, his mother takes up with um, an abusive partner named Stoner. Um, uh, Damon uh, ends up in foster care. Uh, Demon ends up in foster care, uh, and then uh, loses his mom and becomes an orphan, um, and uh, has to kind of cope with that. Um, so we'll be looking at a few passages from there about him kind of coming to terms with what it means to be in his position. Uh, but first, I wanted to start a little bit with his description of his childhood. Um, one of the, at least one of the happier moments of it, um, that I think is important for giving a flavor of, you know, the what it means to grow up in, in the country. So this is a passage, again, right from the beginning. Um, Dead in the heart of Lee County, Right between the rule and coal camp and a settlement people call right poor, the top of a road between two steep mountains, is where our single wide was set. I wasted more hours up in those woods than you'd want to count, alongside of a boy named Maggot, wading the creek and turning over big rocks and being mighty. I could go different ways, but definitely a Marvel hero, as preferable to DC, Wolverine being a favorite. Whereas Maggot tended to choose Storm, which is a girl. Excellent powers and a mutant, but still. Maggot was short for Matt Peggett, related obviously to the screaming lady at my birthday party, his grandmother. She was the reason Maggot and I got to be next door neighbor wild boys for a time, but first he'd need to get born, a little out ahead of me, 
plus getting pawned off on her while his mom took the extended vacay in Goochland Women's Prison. We've got story enough here to F up more than one young life, but it is a project. Um, and so this is kind of his summary of his early childhood, uh, running around in the woods uh, with his next door neighbor who's um, in some sense uh, cousin or brother uh, since, um, you know, uh, Mrs. Peggett, the neighbor is going to be one of the, um, is gonna help raise Matt. And I think that raises just kind of in passing, you know, an important point about what we think of when we think of families and, and, and family values, that uh, working class families do not um, uh, obey the rules of, uh, abide by, look like uh, the standards of the bourgeois, you know, family, the, the, the nuclear family of the, you know, heterosexual married couple and their biological children. They're, they're larger, messier, um, there are many kinds of uh, kinship and affiliation, um, and it's much more based on, um, you know, mutual care than, than anything else. And that's something that's gonna also be a current that runs through this novel. Um, so as, um, as Demon grows up um, and, you know, goes into foster care, he begins to encounter um, situations that make him uh, take stock of the region he was born in and think about it in, in broader ways than, than just, um, you know, his own experience. Uh, what's the bigger uh, social and political picture? And again, so this book is written from Damon's perspective as an adult, looking back on his childhood uh, and, and kind of applying the experience he got to, to making sense of things. Um, so we're gonna skip now to a section of the book where he is in, um, he's in foster care. Uh, he's uh, 10 years old, maybe 11 at this point. Um, and uh, there's been difficulty placing him in a stable uh, foster placement. So he's ended up at what he calls a slave farm for homeless boys, which is a very Dickens uh, kind of situation you know, um, exploited orphans and, and so forth. He was not, not quite an orphan yet. Um, so he's working on a farm uh, with several other foster boys uh, taken in to provide cheap labor and, you know, the state stipend. And what he's doing is chopping tobacco um, and uh, putting it up to dry. And like many of the sections of the book that, that surround work, um, this is going to be a, a place where he thinks about the broader uh, social and um, economic uh, aspects of, of his life. So he asks, why does a man keep trying? On long cold days in the stripping house, I've spent many an hour listening to guys chew over that question. So yes, stripping green leaves would be my problem in years to come. Used to be, the stripping house was a place to hear the best stories in the world. Guys saved them up all year. Now it's mostly just the saddest story ever told. Where the world has left us. A farmer has his land and nothing else. He's more than married to it. He's on life support. If he puts in his acreage in corn or soy, he might net $700 an acre, which is fine and good for the 100 acre guys, Star Wars farmers. What if he's us? with only three that can be plowed. In the little piece of hell that God made special for growing burly tobacco, farmers always got 7,000 an acre. A three acre field is no fortune, but it kept him alive. No other crop known to man that's legal will give him that kind of return on these croplands, precious and small that they are. The rules are made by soil and rain and slope. Leaving your family's land would be like moving out of your own body. That land is alive, a body itself with its own talents and I guess you could say addictions. If you farm on the back of these mountains, your choice is grow tobacco or try something else, anything else, it turns out, and lose everything. While somebody someplace is laughing at your failure, thinking you got what you deserved. Around the time I topped and cut my first tobacco, we noticed the cigarette ad stopped playing. No idea why. If we'd known it was people thinking tobacco was dangerous for kids, even to see on TV with their eyes, we'd have found that dead hilarious. 
Our schools had smoking barrels. Teachers smoked on their breaks, kids at recess. The buyers were telling us the cancer thing was a scare, not proven. Another case of city people trash talking us and our hard work, like anything else we did to feed ourselves, raising calves for slaughter, mining our coal, shooting Bambi with our hunting rifles. Now these people would, that would not know a tobacco plant if they saw one were calling it the devil. If Philip Morris and them knew the devil had real teeth, they sat harder on that secret than you'd believe. Grow it with pride and smoke it with pride, they said, giving out bumper stickers to that effect. I recall big stacks of them at school, free for the taking. Grow and smoke we did while the price per pound went to hell, and a carton got such taxes on it, we were smoking away our grocery money. We drove around with proud tobacco farmer stickers on our truck till they peeled and faded along with our good health and dreams of greatness. If you're standing on a small pile of shit fighting for your one place to stand, God almighty how you fight. Okay. So this is, you know, I was debating uh, whether to include this passage or not because it really does, in some sense, it, it reads like a like a caricature of you know what everybody thinks about um the rural working class you know um bound to this sort of dead end uh reliance on the land stuck in self-destructive behaviors um uh and and you know stubbornly just clinging to to things that are that are killing them but it but the passage is important because that's exactly what the author is going to be dissecting and critiquing uh, throughout this entire book. Why, um, why is it that this happens? And she she starts the explanation of it here with with the tobacco companies, right? It's not that you know this is something that people uh, chose for themselves. This was something that was crammed down their throat uh, by. Um, by Philip Morris and the other tobacco companies that were making enormous profits, right? Um, the farmers might have been making 7,000 an acre, but that was nothing compared to what tobacco companies were making. And this is this is this is the situation of the entire working class, right? Um, uh, that we live in a world that is set up by the ruling class, the capitalist class to generate profits for them. And we are then inundated with propaganda to uh, make us think that, um, to, to tell us that we should be proud of the shitty world that they handed to us. Um, and this is something that'll become more and more clear uh, as, um, as the novel goes on. And in fact, uh, the novel is, is it's set up kind of in, in, in very deliberate uh, ways because right after the question of addiction is introduced with cigarettes, um, the question it's deepened by the introduction of OxyContin uh, around the, the overdose that kills um, Demon's mother. Um, uh, and that's gonna be another running uh, kind of critique in the novel. Um, uh, the drug reps coming to town and, and pushing this um, miracle pain pill on people. Um, uh, so kind of mirroring that passage on cigarettes, we get one where Demon says, after his mother died, what's an, what's an oxy, I'd asked. That November, it was still a shiny new thing, oxycontin, God's gift for the laid off deep hole man with his back and neck bones grinding like bags of gravel. For the bent over lady pulling double shifts at Dollar General with her shot knees and ADHD grandkids to raise by herself. For every football player with some of this or that torn up and the whole world riding on his getting back in the game. This was our deliverance. The tree was shaken and yes, we did eat of the apple. The first to fall in any war are forgotten. No love gets lost over one person's reckless mistake. Only after it's a mountain of bodies bagged do we think to raise a flag and call the mistake by a different name because one downfall times a thousand has got to mean something. It needs its own brand, some point to all the sacrifice. Mom was the unknown soldier. Walmart would have a new stock girl trained in time for the Christmas shoppers um, to knock herself out with the inflatable Rudolphs and be bored senseless before Valentine's candy came in. Uh, our trailer home would be thoroughly Cloroxed and every carpet torn out so the Peggots could rent it to one of Aunt June's high school friends that got left flat by both her kids' daddies. 
Aunt June probably leaned on, leaned hard to help out her old friend, given how they got burned with the last hardship case. But wanting a fresh start for this girl and her little family, I'm sure they scrubbed the place clean of old stains, including the two pencil lines on the kitchen wall that proved I once stood a hair taller than my mom. Her life left no marks on a thing. Uh, and this, this was one of the, the passages that really sort of grabbed me, you know, when I read this book, when it, um, that first made me think that, you know, this might be something more than just, you know, a usual uh, cliche novel, you know, kind of, what would you call it, taking advantage of or, or caricaturing, mocking, whatever, um, uh, the rural working class. Um, because this is stuff that, or I guess it was one of the things that made me think it could be a novel um, yeah, that, that truly had working class politics. Uh, because it took that question of addiction and substance use disorder and put it clearly in 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 the context of um, this inhuman culture that's destroying people both physically and mentally, right? The 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 toll of work on um, on people's bodies, uh, the toll of um, you know a society with few opportunities for a lot of kids so that um, sports, which should be friendly competition, get turned into some kind of a desperate, you know, uh, um, endeavor where people ruin their bodies trying to, you know, compete for an athletic scholarship. Um, and um, so it, it, it takes the question of addiction and substance use and um, says that the, the crisis is much broader than just um, you know, an individual and a pill. There's a whole social system that is um, offering that as the only answer and that we need to fix that um, uh, in, as well as, you know, just talking about the um, the actual sickness. Um, so at this point in the novel, uh, Demon's mom is uh, dead, um, and he has switched to another foster home, uh, what's supposed to be a permanent placement this time with a deeply dysfunctional family, you know, uh, mired in debt, once again wanting him because they'll get, you know, a monthly stipend uh, from, um, from the Department of Social Services. Uh, and in this process, he, you know, he goes back to school and he's um, for the first time kind of confronted with how other people see him as, you know, um, an impoverished foster kid from the back country. Um, and there's a long section where it, where the author explores um, how people come to sell themselves short, um, or how um, how we are taught uh, that our worth is um, less than it actually is. Um, and I wanted to kind of share just a couple passages um, uh, from in there, because um, it's it's the point where where demon I don't know becomes the, the the stereotypical bad kid or starts thinking of himself as a kid who's not supposed to be in school, who's not supposed to be, um, you know, uh, who's not like other kids, not like the good kids. So he says, some are going to say I was never anything better, not even born in a hospital to a mom fixing to take me back to her mobile home, but born in the mobile home. So that's like the Eagle Scout of trailer trash. Kids like me with our teen moms putting whiskey on our gums to shut us up, Coke in the baby bottle. We're the pity of the world. But I started out as decent as any kid, saying please and thank you, doing my homework, figuring out how to get smiled at. I played to win with all my little prides and dreams. So what if they were junior varsity dreams like Mary and Carol Danvers and being an Avenger whenever I grew up? I got up every day thinking the sun was out there shining and it could just as well shine on me 
as on, as on any other human person. Nothing was different afterward, except for my fresh loser eyes, noticing it all. People steering clear, not touching me in gym, not even cheering if I sank a shot, holding up their plate to my face in the lunchroom like I'd eat off it like a dog. I wanted no sun shining on me now. I erased myself like a chalkboard. In my outgrown high water jeans and the old man shoes Mr. Pag had loaned me at Christmas, I joined the tribe of way back country kids with no indoor plumbing and the Pentecostals that think any style of clothes invented since Bible times is a sin. My specialty, acid holes. Who is going to take me shopping for new clothes? Hair over my collar, who's going to cut it? Uh, Miss Banks had noticed I was getting ratty and kept reminding Mrs. Cobb how the monthly check from DSS should more than cover those things. Mrs. Cobb kept saying she meant to get around to it, but just so busy with her kids. So this is this is the yeah it's the the moment when um, when he decides that sort of to check out uh, at least as far as school is concerned and and you know based on my experience as a as a teacher that's a that moment is a real thing uh, it doesn't it's not necessarily always a moment but kids and and research shows as well that it happens usually around eighth or ninth grade. Um, it's a little earlier for demon here. Uh, again, life is the 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 bad stuff in life is condensed and distilled in his case. But um, around eighth or ninth grade, kids um, decide whether they think they belong uh, in school, whether whether you know trying in school is going to uh, pay off for them or whether they're not welcome there, whether they don't, whether they haven't uh, been made to feel that they belong. Um, so this is, again, this is a real thing. And and it, I think part of that, part of what makes this a working class novel, what makes it so politically interesting is that the author constantly returns to this point, constantly returns to the need to struggle to hold on to um, our dignity, our conception of ourself as worthwhile, our conception of ourself as that the sun could shine on us as well as anyone else. Because again, um, most of us don't go through most of the shit that demon goes through, but all of us, all working class people and all uh, people facing every kind of oppression are told um, in all kinds of ways that they are not quite uh, good enough for the good things, right? They're, um, that the sun doesn't shine on them the same way it shines on others. Um, and that uh, that's a really important, again, I think a really important political point because of the the kind of the ongoing struggle in the novel around that question of uh, of dignity, um, and uh, at this point, so in Demon uh, in this at this moment in the novel, when he makes this sort of comes to this conclusion uh, about himself, uh, has been pushed into. Uh, working at an unlicensed dump. Uh, so people uh, dump trash behind a uh, gas station convenience store and he picks through it uh, for four bucks an hour, um, uh, which ends up getting stolen by his, his foster family. Um, and he sort of returns to the question of his, his school and, and, and and life and progress and hope, um, saying that, and I'm going to kind of um, abridge this one a little bit, but the thing about school you don't realize is everybody's moving towards something. Even if you're one of the screw-ups, you still participate. Okay, kids, let's get through this lesson, this unit, this grade. In May, we'll take our standards of learning tests. Maybe our sorry-ass school will do better on scores this year. The teachers, teachers will keep their jobs, and everybody moves on to the next grade. Every kid wants to be older anyway, so there you go, automatic improvement. It's like the escalator thing at the Knoxville Mall. Step on, take your ride. There's always the chance you might run across something shiny and new on your way up. Um, and then he describes his, his work in this 
horrifying, incredibly dangerous dump, um, and ends with, here was our summer, filling that roll off to the max, be it a month, six weeks, doesn't matter. It goes away, the empty comes back, and you're back where you started. Here was the real world, where nobody and nothing gets better. Biding my time till I turned 16 and could drop out of school, with a whole life ahead for applying myself to full-time shit work. Um, uh, and and that you know kind of sums up the 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 hopelessness right of, of this situation. So again, he's um, eleven, maybe yeah, he's eleven years old at this point, um, and has uh, decided that um, you know his lot in life is to do this. Um, and uh, I just want to share a couple more passages because we're getting close to time for um, question and answer. Uh, but uh, there's a couple more major turning points happen in the novel um, where uh, he realizes that, you know, about the necessity to struggle um, for for his own for his own dignity. Um, and the major character in that is, um, I think, a communist. Uh, it's got a, a language arts teacher at a school he ends up in uh, named Mr. Armstrong, um, a black guy from Chicago who who has moved down to Appalachia, um, stayed on because he loved playing the banjo, um, and is now teaching language arts uh, in this high school in rural Virginia. Um, and he is the one who sort of becomes the... Uh, you know, political mentor uh, to Demon, who 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 is going to teach some of the big lessons about um, where about the relationship between white supremacy and capitalism, uh, about the um, the the history of labor struggles in the area. Again, very you know, very communist sounding, um, and. That's going to be kind of the the process of Demon um, turning himself uh, turning himself around and figuring out um, that you know that there's something worth fighting for. Um, so there was just one more passage I wanted to read, and then I'm going to it's kind of a longish one, but then I'm going to uh, open it up for question and answer. Um, so. In Mr. Armstrong's backgrounds project, we learned one thing. If you throw a rock in Lee County, you'll hit somebody with a family that's worked coal. Almost everybody in our class had great grandparents that came over from some country to work in the mines, or they were here already and worked in the mines. They told stories of all the kids in the family ending up working in a mine underneath the same land that was bought from them. The coal guys came in here buying up land without mentioning the buried treasure underneath it. And then all that was left was to work, even little kids, pushing tubs of ore from the coal face to the tracks. Low coal was working 36 inch tall seams, stooping under a mountains. The pawpaw stories were mostly along the lines of, how awesome was that, us busting our asses? Whereas the mamma stories, ma papa and mamma are like grandpa and grandma. Um, whereas the mamma stories lean more towards not awesome, getting your paycheck and fake money that you had to use in the coal company stores to charge you double breathing black dust all day, coughing up black hunks of lung all night, husbands and sons dying all in one day and a shaft blew up. One girl's presentation she called the other side of the coin. This is flippy hair Bettina Cook with her posse of gal pals and her dad that owned the Foodland grocery chain, seven stores in the tri-state area. Packed lunch sandwiches with the cut-off crust that flabbergasted me back in the third grade. Yep, same Bettina. Her family on her mom's side were major shareholders of the Blue Bonnet Mine. She passed out brochures on all the good the company's done for Lee County in the way of town park benches, et cetera. Her great-grandfather won an award from the governor for buying one of the biggest coal veins under Kentucky and figuring out how to pull it out of the ground on the Virginia side so they didn't have to pay some certain tax. She had a slew of relatives that were senators and such in the state house that she showed us pictures of on her computer. Yes, her own computer brought from home uh, also a Motorola phone. Queen Bettina, we all knew she operated at her own level. Mr. Armstrong just said, okay, everybody gets a turn, just listen. Uh, 
For the most part, though, we listened to the crushed leg, dynamite explosion type of stories. This was the oldsters' chance to complain to their grandkids that usually have no time for old people shit. If a miner didn't get buried alive, the question was what part of him would give out first, lungs, back, or knees? I thought of Mr. Pegg that was giving out all over on disability ever since he got hurt. Another old guy topic. How they didn't want handouts. They grew up hardworking men, and that's what they believed in, working. Even if they were on disability now, God damn it to hell. They're not that person. They hate that person. They also talked about union. But I mean this word. Like it was a handshake deal between them and God. We had the general idea, workers wanting their pay, safety, and such. Where did that go? And what was the or else? Or else they'd all walk off the job and let the coal bosses suck their own dicks, Mr. Armstrong said. Not his words, but he got it across. He showed us films. Obviously, we love teachers showing films, nap time, makeout time, if applicable. But this one, Jesus, you needed to see how it came out. Men calling a strike, the company calling in the army to force them back to work. The miners saying, guess what? We got guns too. Serious shit. Battle of Blair Mountain. That turned into the biggest war in America ever, other than the civil one. 20,000 guys from all over these mountains fighting in regiments. They wore red bandanas on their necks to show they were all on the same side, working men. Mr. Armstrong said people calling us rednecks. That goes back to the red bandanas. Redneck is badass. Anyway, it was all in the past. Nobody in class had parents working in the mines now. We'd heard all our lives about the layoffs. The company swapped out humans for machines in every job. Deep hole mines went to strip mines, then to blowing the heads off whole mountains with machines to pick up the pieces. Bettina was like, get real, you all. Companies are in business to make money. That's just a fact. The facts being there's hardly any coal jobs left around here. Bettina also said, there's no such thing as unemployed, just not trying. Her posse all stuck up for her side. And the other kids said city people were the problem for bad-mouthing coal. And the passage doesn't end there, but I want to underline that uh, that short bit. Um, uh, so the uh, the the rich kid whose whose parents are you know coal company shareholders saying there's no such thing as unemployment, um, and then other kids in the class siding with her, um, saying that the problem is just city folks uh, bad mouth and coal. And that's something that we saw, this novel was written in 2016, or published in 2016 and written in the, in the lead up to it. And this is, you know, this is exactly what happened uh, when, you know, people heard uh, Hillary Clinton talking about, um, you know, moving towards sustainability and away from fossil fuels, um, you know, in the absence of that history, that, that understanding of the history of class struggle, in the absence of that working class perspective, um, it became, you know, uh, people working in jobs that depended on fossil fuels, um, siding with fossil fuel companies. Um, and uh, so I'm going to just go back to the book for a second. Um, and um, Mr. Armstrong, so the teacher asks, um, didn't, didn't, the, didn't you ever wonder why there's nothing else doing around here in the way of paying work? Our general thinking was that God had made Lee County the butthole of the job universe. It wasn't God, he said, just ticked off enough, enough for his accent to give him away. I remember that day like a picture. Wouldn't you think, he asked us, the miners wanted a different life for their kids after all the stories you've heard? Don't you think the mine companies knew that? What the companies did, he told us, was put the shut hole on any choice other than going into the mines. Not just here, also in Buchanan, Tazewell, all of Eastern Kentucky. These counties got bought up whole, land, hospitals, courthouses, schools, company owned. Nobody need, needed to get all that educated for being a miner, so they let the schools go to rot. And they made sure no mills or factories got in the door, coal only. To this day, you have to cross a lot of ground to find other work. Not an accident, Mr. Armstrong said, and for once we believed him, because down in the dark mess of our little skull closets, some puzzle pieces were clicking together, and our world made some terrible kind of sense. The dads at home drinking beer in their underwear, the moms at the grocery store with their snap coupons, the army recruiters in shiny gold buttons come to harvest their jackpot in hopeless futures. God damn, 
The trouble with learning the backgrounds is that you end up wanting to deck somebody, possibly Bettina Cook and the horse she rode in on. Not happening, her dad being head of the football boosters and a major donor. Once upon a time, we had our honest living that was God and country. Then the world turns and there's no God anymore, no country, but it's still your, in your blood that coal is God's gift and you want to believe because otherwise it was one more scam in the fuck train that's railroaded over these mountains since George Washington rode in and set his crew to cutting down our trees. Everything that could be taken is gone. Mountains left with their heads blown off, rivers running black. My people are dead of trying or headed that way, addicted as we are to keeping ourselves alive. There's no more blood here to give, just war wounds, madness, a world of pain looking to be killed. So this is an interesting passage uh, because it's, it's it, hopelessness has turned to anger, which doesn't necessarily seem like a positive thing, but um, what's happened is the sort of self-hatred, the, the, the internalized um, narrative of, of demon and the other people in this region being, being worthless um, has started to uh, be transformed into um, anger at the people who have profited uh, from making it that way. And that's going to shape the rest of the novel um, and uh, um, and shape what demons com Demon comes to eventually, which is um, uh, his role as an artist um, helping to uh, further the ideological struggle. Um, against this uh, ruling class propaganda. And I'll stop there. Um, uh, I'd love to hear whatever questions, comments, um, uh, et cetera, uh, that folks have. Thank you, Scott. Um, we are now going to open the floor for discussion. So I'm now looking for raised hands. Joe, I am unmuting your mic. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. I put, I typed this question into the questions. I didn't know if that would get looked at or not or by whom. But I was struck by what you said early in your presentation. How could you be so surprised by a King Solver novel that is knowingly sympathetic to the working class? She spent her whole life writing such novels. I was really surprised that, you know, a knowledgeable teacher reader like you making that comment about her. Okay, so I am looking for more raised hands. Margaret, um, I have just unmuted you. Well, I very much appreciate uh, your raising this book for us to read and also uh, your, your discussion of it, Scott. Um, actually, I had, I had read the Poisonwood Bible many years ago, and I just love the way she is able to get the voice of these young people. She gets it so perfectly. And um, then, of course, in Poisonwood Bible, the children are younger, but, but with, um, with Demon, she just she, she uses vocabulary that um, is, you know, it's right in there with, with the way uh, young people speak. Um, picking up on your point um, about Mr. Armstrong's kind of um, uh, educating the children in, or educating demon anyway, in uh, a class, looking at a class, looking at his life through a class perspective. Um, at the end of the, of the book, which I picked up to read <laughs> just before this session, um, he says, a good story doesn't just copy life, it pushes back on it. And I thought that that's, you know, that's what we as communists, that's what we do, that's what's different about communists as opposed to accepting what happens to us, but, but pushing back against it. Um, I was struck by the word juice that he used at the end. And I, I wonder if you have, um, you know, a comment on that. I was wondering because he would he would talk about about uh, getting well uh, the way I understood him using the word juice was not so much a political understanding but rather um, 
uh, uh, psychological or emotional caring about other people. And that kind of develops in him. Um, and at the very end, I took this quote for Juice. He said, if it had, um, it's when he's, he's alone and, um, you know, trying to get, get back and deciding whether he's going to live or die, actually. Um, he says, if it, had, if it had been July, my heart already would have cracked for the beauty so, uh, you know, his, his appreciation of, his re-appreciation of the beauty of, of, country, of this country life that he had, that he had led, uh, I mean, that, that he had grown up in, which leads my, to a question, actually. He, he speaks about the land economy people versus the city economy. I was wondering, maybe you could speak to that. Thank you, Margaret. Judy Ann? Well, you have me in tears. Yes, Barbara is an incredible writer. And I am living in a situation where a grown black man, the, the only thing that helped to make him feel like he really was somebody he was born in the South. He went to elementary school in Ohio, where it was integrated. He came back to the South uh, into segregated schools. He had a teacher. He had one teacher in high school in Louisiana in a little tiny town who came into the classroom the first day and said, um, this is the curriculum, and you have to read it uh, because that's what you have to do. But I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to bring in other literature for you, other things to read. And that's what the class read. And that's when he began to feel like, oh, there's something more going on. There's something different than what I have experienced in, in the South here. And, you know, he had to go into the, the service. So he, um, when his friends started coming back in body bags, he joined the Air Force and got into a job where he never went and killed anybody. He recognizes he helped by, he had some help in, in helping them go off and kill other people, but he didn't. And he kind of fit himself in and now has become so furious again, just watching what's going on. And I mean, I will read this book with him so that he can, we are talking about how young people just almost don't want to go on. What if they don't have a teacher that says something? What if they don't have an adult around them who has the capacity to say something? And then you see how important teachers really are. So thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Judy Ann. Eric, let's, let's have Scott respond and people can continue to think so let's, can we turn it over to Scott and then turn it back to the audience? Scott? Um, yeah, so um, to Joe, um, I, I agree with you entirely. This is in fact the first of her novels uh, that, I, uh, that I have read um, and I am going to read uh, the Poisonwood Bible um, straight away. Uh, so um, I, I, I probably, should not have been surprised at her partisanship to the working class. Um, but I think coming to it from um, just living in our culture uh, and seeing the, the torrent of filth that is poured onto working class people, and especially, and, and you know, um, in particular, lately rural working class people um, with, you know, in, in um, stuff like, that country song, try that in a small town, 
or um, the other one, uh, Richmond, North of Richmond, and and the way those things are taken up by reactionary you know, ideologues, um, it was a really, really pleasant shock to, to see um, something that overtly partisan. Um, on the question of, of juice, um, which I took to mean sort of, yeah, uh, like the, the psychological and emotional energy to care, yeah, about people. And that's, um, those two things in the novel are, are very linked, the, the class perspective and the um, kind of psychological um, ab ability to care about people and to continue helping people, um, right? Uh, the what what demon is fighting for, in fact in a certain sense what allows him to maintain that that emotional humanity in in you know in spite of the really degrading circumstances um, is coming to this understanding that it's not just there's re, there's bigger stories behind all of this there's reasons behind all of this and there's a fight uh, that's possible. And on the land economy and the city economy, that was a really interesting point. What he talks about is, uh, and I believe it's in a conversation with um, the editor at the at the newspaper when he where he becomes a a cartoonist, um, is that is the idea that um, in the country people still live off the land, even if you don't make a wage, um, you can go hunt, you can gather. There's still some sense of of a an ability to subsist, and there's also there's an attempt to impose the city economy, what he calls the city economy, on top of that, which is to force people into wage labor. So if we think of it in Marxist terms, what they're talking about is this process of enclosure that Marx describes in 18th century England, where the the commons were were privatized and taken away from people, and people were thereby forced into wage work. Um, that um, what the suggestion is that this that's still going on somehow that that um, the part of the resistance to capitalism's enclosure privatization uh, of the land is um, this push to be able to you know hunt and and feed yourself outside of um, it's not something that you know becomes a huge point in, in political struggle, but it, but it's something that for me resonated with Marxism. And to Judy, um, I'm really glad that that you um, that you found the this this uh, my account of this book so moving. Um, and you know I'm I'm also someone who had a teacher like the one you were describing. Um, you know, I I could have been a kid that was uh, written off. Um, and specifically on um, the idea of, of being what it means to be in the military. Um, you know, Diaz said before that, you know, we are not, working class people are not responsible for the crimes of the rule. We're not to blame for the crimes of the ruling class. Um, we, um, we're not complicit in them, we have an empowering responsibility um, to struggle to correct them. Um, and I think uh, that is, you know, something that for me, uh, you know, shown through this book as well, this idea that um, we can get put into shitty situations, we can get told that we're worthless, um, uh, we can get blamed uh, for the stuff going on around us. Um, it's not our fault, but um, the working class is um, the 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 force that can come together and and summon the strength to fix it. Uh, and uh, that's that's what I have. Thank you. So um, I'm looking again one more time for raised hands. The floor is open for discussion. And let's go to Shelby. Good morning, Scott. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed the talk, but I, I, I primarily wanted to uh, commend the format. Uh, I think this is 
I think the experiment kind of uh, showed value, and especially for uh, young people and not so young people who maybe are not introducing to these types of works. For myself, I'm not a, a, a fiction reader, and uh, a, a lot of works uh, uh, of fiction I would probably like to get into if I really was kind of encouraged uh, to do so in some ways, or began to feel that it would be important maybe to just look into these works. So I think this format kind of uh, in encourages you to explore a little bit more and see the, the value of, uh, of, of these types of, of works that kind of shows uh, working class folk and how they uh, uh, deal with life. And it probably would surprise a lot of people to find out, you know, how uh, working class life uh, involves just about all working class people and uh, and we kind of even think about it in similar ways when we really begin to think about it and and the complexity of it but yet you can get into it and and see how it uh, affects your life and how you can make changes uh, I had the opportunity to work uh, in a in a prison in, in the library, and, and I found it interesting that we would kind of uh, introduce some of the some of the guys to uh, uh, black literature, and uh, they had never been uh, introduced to that literature uh, before, and uh, they really became some really became just, I mean, they just the the writings of uh, uh, Wright, you know, Richard Wright and James Baldwin, and that they had never ever been introduced to. And then they became, they, be, they wanted to read those books. And that was one of the things that uh, I was most grateful for, uh, for the, the book clubs and, 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 and the prisons. It made me see that uh, people could be introduced to these books and they really benefited from them. So uh, thanks again for for this format. I think it's, it was really good in how you handled it. That's all. Thank you. Mike Madden, uh, I saw that you uh, raised your hand several times. If you want to make a comment or introduce a question, please be encouraged to do so now. Yes, so um, everyone on this call, and especially to our party and to Scott and Dee, uh, I'm completely blown away. I've never read anything of King Solver, but what you have done and what our party is doing is making it available. The life of a major oppressed section in our country, and we're hearing their words and we're hearing their life is like. So I say, well, how come, what's the big deal, Scott? I say, oh, the oxygen and the, and people's stories need to be further expanded so we could have an appreciation on a personal visceral level of other people's lives, Scott. Uh, so I say thank you. And I say to Dee and Scott and the Education Collective, uh, more of the same, all power, keep going. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, Michael. And um, Dee, we do have one question from Henry in the questions box um, that Henry I could read. Open his, Henry, let's open Henry's. Uh, oh, okay. great. Henry, there you are. Thank you. King Solver is uh, well known for introducing ecological issues into her novels. In fact, some of them revolve around those issues. So I'm wondering if you can say something about her introducing ecological issues, and that's the first question. And the second question is that the second question has to do with resolving the contradictions that you you and she have raised between the owners and the workers, and the and complicated importantly by 
the, the issue of uh, a green transition. So how how does she deal with the green transition or a just a just just transition for the people who live in this this region? Thanks. Thank you, Henry. Okay, let's turn it over to Scott now for uh, responses to those uh, questions and then and concluding. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, in response to Henry, um, I think the, the center of the ecological issue um, in this book is the is the connection between um, between the the people and um, and the land and then the natural world. Uh, so there's the it is brought up in many ways. Sometimes it's you know ownership and use is in the case of farming, but there's also um, the uh, question of, of a kind of nebulous right to enjoy uh, the land that that kind of breathes, especially in Demon's early childhood when he's always you know out in the woods. Um, and she draws a lot of metaphors um, as well from. Uh, from the natural uh, world. So she, there's a long passage uh, where she talks about, um, you know, learning to recognize the different kinds of snake. And um, she says, if you if you care enough about something, um, you learn to see the differences. Um, and and that question of, of caring enough to look closely and see the differences kind of moves through the novel. So. Um, the, the 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 ecological angle is very important. She doesn't offer a um, a resolution, I would say, to the to the contradictions, but she does um, frame it in such a way that the the contradictions become less important. Right? Because if the the if what has been destroyed by capitalism in this region is the um, connection between the people and the land, um, part of that struggle is to, to restore that connection. So the ecological is brought in with the, with the, the economic and the, and the political. Um, uh, so it, it doesn't, it is not raised as a contradiction maybe in a way that it would be in a in a, a novel that was less anchored in the in the natural world or from the novel. I, I do I want to read more of of, of her work um, and I'll look forward to um, you know exploring some of those ecological themes. Um, and to to Shelby and, and Mike, I'm glad you enjoyed the format. Uh, and um, Shelby, uh, if you have a if if I think you should give a book talk, you know, tell us about some of the 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 works that have been um, that have been meaningful, uh, and, and yeah, just again, the, the big, I think, conclusion to draw or, or inspiration to draw from this book is that, uh, we, um, we have to struggle for everything, right? We have to struggle to be what our humanity tells us to be. We have to struggle to change the world. Uh, to make it compatible with our humanity um, and uh, you know art, um, the literary art of King Solver, the the visual arts that Demon practices in the novel, um, like though those play a really major role uh, in the in the ideological struggle. And and thanks to um, uh, Margaret for bringing out that quote from the end, which I had forgot. A good story doesn't just copy life; it pushes back on it, um, which is uh, the kind of culture world way of saying um, it's not just about up till now philosophers have understood the world the point is to change it um, and and I think that's you know King Solver is trying to do that so uh, thanks again uh, for your attention and um, yeah that's it okay before you leave we want to thank Scott and Eric for for facilitating this uh, this class um especially thank you scott for a format that was quite engaging surprisingly to me so i get no credit um at all um but we would like to encourage others to identify works 
that uh, especially help us to deepen our understanding of how to fight against male supremacy and white supremacy and all the various forms of capitalist uh, uh, culture and, uh, and ideology that uh, oppress us and, and uh, out of which we have to break the chains. So, th so thank you, Scott. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this little experiment, which was very successful. Have a great day. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.